So welcome everybody. So now today is the BioXL webinar number 75, and it'll be about the VIMD. It is a software for visual analysis of molecular dynamics. The presenter are Matteo Linares from Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, uh, Robin Schoenberg from Leopold University. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology, and with me is Otto Andersson for IT Center Finland, and we are representing by Excel. So the webinar is recorded, so just that you are aware of it. And during the webinar, you can ask questions using the function that you see at the bottom of the Zoom application. Depends on which operating system you have, you might see this symbol of this one. You just click and you type your question. And it will be nice if you can just, just write if you have or not a microphone, because at the end of the webinar, we will go through the question and we will unmute you if you have a microphone. Otherwise, we will we'll read the question and Mathieu or Robin will answer. After the webinar, maybe you still have some question. Please go to U. There, there is a particular category called by Excel webinar where you see a subcategory. There, you can question and Matteo and Robin will answer to your question, in particular in the following week. And this is the correct path to get to the category. Uh, so something about the presenter of today. So Robin is a PhD student working at Linshop University, in particular in the group of scientific visualization at the Media and Information Technology Center. His main research focus, developing technique for molecular visualization, and indeed he was is one of the main developers of VIMD. Mathieu Linares is currently an application expert at PDC Center for High Performance Computing, hosted by the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He received his PhD in 25, in 2005, at the University of Paul Cezanne, close to Marseille, Marcel, oh, in Marseille, so sorry, focuses on killarity, organic electronics, and molecular interaction. And uh, then he moved, uh, he went around, and then from 2018, he, up to 2023, June, he was associate professor at Linköping University in the same group of Robin. And he, there he put together his theoretical chemistry background and the, and the visualization. And this was make possible the, that VMD is what is now today. So now the presentation will be started by Robin and then we will follow by Mathieu. I will give the word to Robin. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for that very nice and concise introduction. Let's see if Mathieu can share his screen. He's going to share the slide. And he's muted, it seems. Here we go. There we go. So, um, welcome everyone to our talk on uh, visual interactive analysis of molecular dynamics, which is in short VIMD. Uh, I am Robin Skånberg, and uh, Mathieu Linares is also here to present with me today. Uh, so first I'm going to dive into the history of VIMD, which started as a prototype back in 2018. And then uh, Mathieu was part of the uh, theoretical uh, a chemistry group in KTH, and I was part of the same group which I am today in the sci scientific visualization group in Linköping, Norrköping. And it was a joint collaboration for a project where they wanted to study a very specific molecular system, which consisted of stacked amyloid fibrils with fluorescent ligands. And the research questions that they had at hand was where do the ligands bind? And what's the, conf what's the favorite conformation of these ligands when uh, bonded to the structure? 
and what's the absorption spectra when they're bonded and when they're not bonded. So we developed uh, some techniques in an, uh, an uh, or an implementation in vivo, which is another research software which we have in uh, North Shopping as a prototype. And uh, maybe you can go ahead. And what, what we learned from this initial prototype was that we could generalize these core principles which we have developed, uh, which was more or less the integrated interactive analysis portion of it. It's a, it's a very common pattern which you see in visualization software that you, uh, you, you visualize, you study the data, and you analyze it, and you formulate a, a new hypothesis based on the data, and then you compute properties based on this, and you repeat this pattern. And if you expose all of this in the same application, uh, you can minimize the iteration time and reduce the friction for the end user. And it also allows us to exploit synergies between the different components in a system, software system, that is. Uh, so this is the current version of EMD, and it shares some similarities to the old prototype. There's a lot of windows here because we just want to be show more or less what's there. But uh, at the bottom, you can see, oh, thank you. So the first thing here in the back is the, the spatial view, we call it, where you can kind of, you look at the animation of the of a trajectory and see how it plays over time. And you can control your representations. And the next window is the script editor, which is, which is kind of the main component where you define your properties, which you want to compute over the set of frames, which is your data set. And once you, you define your properties and evaluated them. You can look at them and you can study them in the different views. And in the timeline, you look at the, te the temporal aspect of the properties and how they evolve over time. And in the distributions view, you look at the distributions of these properties. And the density volume is also a, a type of distribution, but it's a three-dimensional view instead. And then we have the Ramachandran plot, which is something that you should all be familiar with, I assume, the audience here. Uh, and then there's a, a quirky thing, which is called a shape space, which Mathieu will cover later. But it, it roughly gives you a, a linear estimate of the evolution of the geometry, the geometrical deformation over time of the structures. Yes. So. With this software, we developed our own scripting language. And the motivation for developing a new scripting language was to come up with something which is very simple and path specific in this case, uh, that can provide, a, can provide very good specific feedback to the user. So we can make very, very precise error messages, for example, based on input. And it also allows us to inspect uh, expressions so if you hover an expression within the script editor, you can you can directly look at the expression and sub-expressions and look at what's the what's the type of this, what's the length of it. So you can actually get some feedback in that you're actually computing what you're supposed to compute. Uh, and it also provides us with a way of giving you visualizations. So in, in this case, uh, the user is hovering an expression which is computed at an angle within three different residues. And in that case, we draw, we highlight the atoms, we draw lines between these angles which are formed, right? And we signify it also with a wedge to emphasize that it's an angle. Uh, the syntax of the language is uh, a declarative syntax, which might not be so common these days. Uh, but it, it more or less, it's, you, you state what you want should be accomplished but without specifying how it should be accomplished, which would be an imperative language where you make explicit control flow statements. And in this case, control flow is implicit to the, the order of the operation. And you tie the, these results of this expression into variables which you can reuse in, in later expressions and, and such. So down here, we have an example of some uh, expressions where we, we make some selection of uh, residues 
that are matched to the, the name alanine, for example. And then we take a, a sub portion of that and we use Python. In, we, we are, our ranges are inspired by the Python syntax where you can have this open-ended way. So we have five column and that means from five upwards to whatever you have there, for example. And there's, there's more details to this, but we will cover that soon enough. Uh, uh, one quirky aspect of the scripting language or uncommon aspect, I would say, is the keyword in, which declares uh, contextual operations. So if you have the keyword in on the left-hand side, you specify your operation which wants to be, that you want to perform. And on the right-hand side of the keyword, you provide the context. And for n context, the resulting type will have length n. So in the example here, the user wants to compute the angle for three residues. And on the right-hand side, you specify, right, oh, I want to do this operation for residue one to, one to three, right? And then you want to compute the angle between these indices. And this uh, replaces this traditional for loop that you would see in imperative language. And script eva evaluation typically occurs in three scenarios. And the first one is during static validation. And that is during comp the compilation phase, more or less. So when you're satisfied with the script and you stop typing, it, we, we wait a, a second or two, and then we start compiling the script, which usually doesn't take that, that long. Uh, and there, we validate the script that you've written against the currently loaded topology. So we can actually see and verify that everything that you've written here makes sense in the context of this data set that you're, that you're working on. And the second scenario is the data evaluation. And that's when you actually want to extract a value out of an expression in order to store it for later use. And the third one is something that I already alluded to before, which is this visualization part. So when you hover an expression, we can render out, uh, we can render some geometrical primitives such as point lines, spheres, and triangles, for example, that we can show you superimpose on the structures to kind of provide you with meaningful feedback. If, is this what you actually mean when you wrote this expression? And we can also highlight sets of atoms to clarify that. And Every implemented procedure within the scripting language must support the data evaluation, the second one, right? But it can also optionally support the static validation and the visualization part as well. So when you evaluate your script, some of these variables which you have defined will automatically be promoted into properties. And this promotion occurs automatically. And it's based on if the variable is dynamic, which means in our case that it changes over the frames of the trajectory. For example, if it has a dependency on the atomic coordinates, which change over time, for example. And if it's of, of these three base types, which we, we use in the language, which is float, distribution, and volume. And if it's one of these types, it will be exposed to the rest of the application of properties. And that's in the timeline window, for example, the distribution window and the volume window. And then we can look at them. So now, Mathieu, I leave the word to you. And hopefully, hopefully you will enlighten us with a demo. You need to unmute yourself, Mathieu. Here we are. So thank you, Robin. So I hope that you can hear me well. So I just open VMD now. And when you open it, it comes with the preloaded data sets. And you can adjust the font size. So I'm going to push it a bit more. So it's a bit more comfortable for you. So uh, you can click, left click, and rotate easily like that. And you can also right click and translate. If you double click somewhere in VMD, it's going to recenter the camera. And like that, it's going to be easier to jump to a specific part of your molecule you are interested in. And of course, you can use the scroll uh, to zoom in and out. So uh, as Robin mentioned here, it is the script here. 
and we can then uh, evaluate it and maybe to illustrate the visual feedback that Robin was talking about. So you see here that we have selected the residual anine, but only from the second to the eighth one. And you can see the highlights, or you can see here, probably, uh, if I play the dynamic, it's going to be a bit easier. I'm going to jump a bit here. So here you can see, for instance, the feedback between the distance between two atoms. And here you can see the angle one two two one three for all the alanine residue with some feedback provided. Uh, we here evaluate a radial distribution function and also a spatial distribution function. So you can either click evaluate or you can also use the well-known shortcut shift enter to do your evaluation. And when it's done, uh, you can go in the timeline and in the distribution, and then you can click and drag the property that you have calculated. So here it is the first distance. You can increase the number of subplots. And when it when you have a, a, a variable like that, I mean, a property like that, that contains 15 value, for instance, or several values, you can either choose to plot all of them like this, but you can also choose to plot the mean value, the variance, and, and the mean max, for instance, on top of it. I mean, everything is modular. You can then uh, have them move from one to, to another one. And when you are tired of them, you can then throw them uh, outside the window. Uh, the same in the property here. You can do like this and add another one. And uh, so here you can, for instance, have the property for the aggregated value, uh, for instance. and by doing a right click here, uh, you can also change the plot type. So for the distribution, we also provide uh, area or bins, uh, bars, sorry. And uh, you can change the color if you wish. And uh, I don't know, change the transparency also by reducing the alpha here. Something like this. Uh, if I drop on top of that now, the all the values of, of A1, you can see that we also have some feedback between the distribution and uh, and the spatial view. So for instance, you can see that if I select this specific line, well, I, mean, I don't know, sorry. Yeah, here for instance, you can see now I have selected a specific uh, residue, I mean, and I can see the feedback in, in, in there. Uh, in the same way I didn't show, but here you get also the 15 value that are accessible and you can like that turn them uh, on and off if you wish. Uh, I would like to mention uh, also a property that we have in the timeline, which is uh, some filtering that you can enable and you have a temporal window, which means that you're going and when you turn on this filtering, uh, then in the in the property, another uh, sets of property will be uh, evaluated just for this specific uh, section of the trajectory that lies between the two lines. So like that, I can also plot my distribution, my filtered distribution, if I want. Maybe I can change the color so we see it a bit better here. So like that, you can superimpose uh, the two distribution. Uh, the navigation in the timeline and the distribution, you can scroll uh, using the, the wheel. You can click and drag with the left button. And if you want to zoom to a specific part of the trajectory, you can use the control plus left button like this. And if you want to go back to the initial view, you just double click. And the same, so the same, uh, same type of navigation happened here. Well, double click would reinitialize. Uh, I'm now going to show you briefly the, the shape space that Robin mentioned before, and I'm going to remove the filtering so we get the shape space for uh, the entirety of our trajectory. And so here that you see that we are looking at the entirety of our system, which is this uh, aligning chain, 15 aligning chain. And you can see uh, kind of redistribution uh, in the shape space. So that will tell you if your object, so here my chain is linear and it's also interactive. So if I click here, I'm gonna jump to the point that correspond to linear. And this is the beginning of my trajectory. And as you can see, my chain is pretty linear. 
or I can look at this conformation that would be more planar. And if I zoom on it, you can see that, yeah, I mean, it, uh, maybe I can move that a bit so you see a bit better. Maybe center the view here. So you see that it forms kind of more like a plane, actually. Or we get this extreme point here that is closer to the isotropic. So here, my chain is forming like kind of a sphere. So this is interesting if you want to follow the conformation of a specific molecule. And I just wanted to illustrate it here, but I will show another example much more in detail uh, later. Uh, so VIMD uh, can read several formats. And uh, so here, this is a multiple PDB that comes loaded with the, with the trajectory. But lately we have implemented CIF file. So you can open CIF file if you want. So here, this is uh, a pretty big, uh, CIF that uh, I found on the on the PDB database, uh, and you can also load uh, Chromax file because we have we are working uh, in close collaboration with the with the Chromax uh, environment. And I will start here with the trajectory that uh, that is made of uh, an aspirin molecule and the the protein it interacts with. So when I drop a grow file in VIMD, as I just did, as you saw me uh, doing, uh, there is an automatic representation uh, that is established by the software. So if I open to representation now, you can see that this has been created automatically by, by VIMD. So it created something for the protein, something for the ions, something for the ligands, which is not protein, protein or nucleic or whatever or ions. It also recognized, as you understood, nucleic, but we don't have any DNA or RNA in this data set. And then finally, we get the water. And by default, VIMD is not displaying the water. So I can show it to you here. That would be my box with the water, but by default, we, we're not gonna see it. So here, this remaining script uh, is from, uh, from before. And here I showed you, I just dropped the grow file, right? Uh, but if I want to drop, uh, if I want to analyze the trajectory, I also need to drop the XTC file that correspond to the, the, the trajectory, and it needs to have the same number of atoms than in the core file. So by doing that, the animation window appear, and now I can navigate in my trajectory. And as you can see, this is, uh, in this trajectory, we get this aspirin molecule that is leaving the pocket of, uh, of the protein. All right, so I'm going to turn off the ions for the moment and just focus on uh, the protein uh, and the aspirin molecule. And I'm going to clean clear my, my script here. And then I'm going to show you how to uh, select two atoms. So using shift and click here, I can select two atoms and then I can do a right click and go to script. And if I do that, it's going to propose me some options to calculate the distance because I get selected two atoms. So you can see that all those expressions here are exactly, well, will produce the same results. Obviously, they are just different way to express the same thing in, in, in VMD language. And for every selection, you will either have a property or just a selection that you will be able to save. And if I click, it's going to appear now in my script editor and I can evaluate it going to move that a bit away so we have a better view. If I select uh, now three atoms, two, three, if I didn't select three atoms, so let me start over. So if I select three atoms like that and go on script, I can calculate an angle. And if I include a fourth atom, I'm going to be able to calculate the diagonal, of course. So we will do this those evaluation later and, and look, look at them in, in more detail. But for the moment, uh, we will focus on defining a pocket for, the, for this aspirin molecule. So you can see that right now when I interact uh, with the molecule, I highlight atoms per atom. And this is because my selection tool here, uh, in the selection tool, I have chosen the gra granularity atom, which is by default. But I can change that and go to residue. This time, every time I hover on an atom, the full residue is going to be highlighted. So like that, with one click, I can select my full uh, aspirin molecule. All right, so now let's put it back inside the pocket. And well, you don't see the pocket because I'm just showing the backbone here, but trust me, it's there. Uh, and what I can do now is go to selection and I want to grow my selection. 
and I'm going to grow my selection not, co not covalently, but radially this time. So I can use the cursor if I want to, or I can just do a control click and then enter the value I want. It's going to be four for Angstrom. And then I can apply this grow of selection. So now I get selected. I have selected my molecule and the all the residue because of my granularity residue here, all the residue that are within four Angstrom of the protein, of the molecule, sorry. So now I can just unselect this molecule and I can do a right click now on any of the residue that are highlighted and I can save this selection in my script editor. So now I'm gonna rename this selection to pockets, for instance. And now I can use that, well, for several things. For instance, I can define a new uh, representation and using this pocket keyword as a filter. And I maybe can change that to licorice and I'm gonna change the, the coloring to res IDX and here it is. So we can identify the residue that consists that constitute the pockets here. So as I mentioned, now I can also use Pocket to define um, some properties. So for instance, I might be interested into the distance between the Pocket and the residue AIN, which is my aspirin here. And so I'm gonna move out of my Pocket slightly here. And you can, if I hover onto D1, you can see that here it's, actually the distance between the center of mass of the pocket and the center of mass of the aspirin molecule. I can do better than that by using the distance pair function if I want to. And this part is just to illustrate some functionality of the language and uh, how you can play a bit with it. So let's say now uh, if I use the distance pair and I'm gonna use the pockets and the aspirin molecule, just that. And if I hover on top of it, oh, you can see that now I get 200 values in D2. And pocket is defined at the residue level, but the aspirin is defined at the atomic level. So since we have 10, uh, 10 uh, residue in our pocket and 20 atoms in our, in our uh, aspirin, therefore, uh, this is of dimension uh, 200 here. I can modify that because maybe I'm just interested into the distance between the center of mass of the pocket and the center of mass of the molecule only. There, uh, I say the center of mass of the residues of the pocket and the center of mass of the molecule. So I can do that this way by using the, the, the center of mass function. Like this. And now, If I look at D3, uh, I forgot something. I forgot a parenthesis here. If I look at D3 now, it's made of only 10 values. Compose this to dimension 10, the all distance between each center of mass of the residue of the pocket and the center of mass of the molecule. Right, finally, I can also, if now I want to take into account all the atoms of the pocket and not only the center of mass of each residue, I can use the flatten function to flatten the pockets and then the center of mass of the aspirin. And uh, there we go. And if I look at D4, now you can see here, uh, that we have 123 atoms in, in, in the pockets and we are looking at each of them with the center of mass of the, of the aspirin. All right, when you have, uh, sorry about that, there is a lot of noise in the building right now. I don't know if it's disturbing uh, for you, I hope not. So um, another functionality is that we can also import energy file coming from Chromax. So uh, I can just, drop it here and then it's going to appear as a table. And so the way to do that is to import and import uh, the, the energy file here. We can also import XVG and CSV uh, if later you want to plot it in the, in the timeline. Uh, but 
when I hover here, I can see all the terms that are contained in this energy file. So let's say if I'm interested into the particular one, the Coulombic interaction between uh, the protein and, and, and the aspirin, well, I can just add the, so I can just here add the flag that correspond to the Coulombic interaction, which is 68. And now if I hover, you can see that this is the Coulombic interaction between the protein and the molecule. Uh, in the same way, I can calculate the lennard jones interaction, or not calculate, but extract, I should say, the lennard jones interaction from, and, and then there it is. And then I can, if I want, I can add them together. It just simply doing it like that, basic mathematical. And here it's not working because I should use, of course, the same variable. And here it is. And now in my timeline, I can plot, well, for instance, one of the distance that we have calculated. Let's say uh, we're going to take this one. And we can also plot, for instance, now the total energy uh, coming from, from the EDR file. So now I'm going to show you how to define a dynamic selection. And so this was the pocket. And now I'm going to define a dynamic selection. And so to that, I'm going to use the filtering. And I'm going to use uh, a function that's called within. So here, what I want is the solvent molecule. And within five angstrom of the aspirin molecule. And here they are. I can change in licorice, but what you can see here also is that the molecule, the water molecule are not complete. Some of them are just, just have an OH, right? This is because here I just have all the atoms that are within. But if I want to consider all the residue, if one of the atom is within five angstrom of the molecule, I can add this residue key keyword just before the expression. And here, all the residue is going to appear. So if I play this trajectory, obviously, all the molecules are going to fly away because they have been evaluated for a specific frame. So if I want them to be evaluated for all the frames, I need to click the order update button here. And then they are re-evaluated for every frame. I can use this function again, so I'm going to copy this here, and I can use this uh, expression to calculate some, to to count, for instance, what are the water molecule uh, here. So I just type in this, count the res name sol n within five or res name ain, and I can evaluate that. And if I plot it now, well, and if I look at the value, What's evaluated here is actually the number of atoms, obviously, as it was before. So, but if I want the number of residue, I can use here, the residue keyword here. And if I reevaluate now, I will find a number that corresponds to the number of residue of water molecule, uh, of water molecule. And what you can see here on this graph is as the, molecule is leaving the pockets, uh, the number of molecule increase, the number of molecule uh, increase here. All right, so when you are when you are here, you might want to save all your progress and be able to reuse uh, them later to not have to retype all those uh, all those things in your script editor. So you can go to file and save the workspace. And when I do that, I can go there and save the workspace and I'm going to save it as bio Excel. And if I show you this file now, all right, so this is how it looks like, this file. So first, it stored information about your, your topology and your trajectory, information about the cameras, all the information about the different representation we have defined, if it's a dynamic selection or if it's a dynamic selection here or not. Sorry, and Mathieu, so could you use larger fonts maybe? I'm Thank you. Not, I'm not sure I can on this on this slide. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, on, on this uh, on this thing, unfortunately. But everything is saved basically, and also the content of the, of your script is saved. So I'm going to switch now to 
uh, another data set and I'm gonna just now take this via file and then drop it immediately because you can also drop this via file into it and then everything is gonna be loaded. Your grow file, your XDC file and, and so on. Uh, before I start by exploring this data set, I just want to give you a bit of context about the uh, uh, about uh, this uh, data set. So it's uh, it's a uh, it's about uh, amyloid uh, formation of amyloid and detection of amyloid because you all know that uh, amyloid diseases uh, are a big issue and Alzheimer and Parkinson are, are two examples of them. And we are collaborating with a group in Inshoping that are, have been developing those. Um, fluorescent markers. And uh, we can tune the markers by changing uh, by changing the chemical unit into it to reach different color. And those markers, they are also specific to different folds. So they can be used to detect some, uh, some disease, but not other diseases, for instance. And because we are interested in the fluorescence of those molecules, we, we focus a lot on the planarity of the molecule to see how the planarity is affecting, uh, or to see how the fibril and the contact with the fibril is affecting the planarity. And we can also perform a QMMM calculation to see the effect of the environment, but that's another story. All right, mm -hmm. getting back to the data, and here it is, it's loaded. And here you see that I already have a script that I, uh, that I have typed. So if we look at it in a bit more detail, what we do is we can count the residue PFT that are within two angstroms of the protein. So that's is telling us how much molecule are aggregating uh, during the trajectory. So I just evaluating it right now. And when it's done, I'm gonna be able to plot it here. So here I can follow the number of molecules that are aggregating rating over time. And I'm gonna zoom now on, on one molecule, doesn't matter which one. Because so here, what we do is we define diagonal angle, and you see that we define it for all the PFT molecules, so for all the molecules. So I forgot to tell you about this data set window that contains information about your data set, your growth file, your XTC, but also all your residue with visual feedback. So here I'm calculating the diagonal DH1 and DH2 and so on and so forth, but I'm doing it for all the molecule at the same time. I can also group my properties together if I want, like I can combine DH2 and DH3 to define a new property that is DH center, because this molecule is, is symmetric and for a reason I might be interested only in the center. And then I can calculate the planarity, which is actually derived from those diagonal angle like that. And here I'm also calculating the RMSD for all the molecule, as you can see. So I'm just gonna plot quickly the property, the planarity and the RMSD here, and I'm gonna go to the distribution and do the same thing. And I'm gonna switch to some color map to make it easy to follow. Yes. It did, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. All right, so what we wanna do with that is actually to identify the molecule that are, that are the more planar, you know, and find the one that's actually aggregated somewhere on, on the protein. And what's very interesting is like, by just looking at this planarity parameter, we can quickly see the outliers, right? And also we get visual feedback. So I don't know if you see very well, but my molecule, this molecule now is turning yellow on my screen and this is actually this one. So if I zoom in a bit more, now you can see here, this is this molecule that is, zoom in a bit, a bit interesting, all right. You can see this molecule that is the 39th residue. And I can also see that there is another one is just on this side here that is also quite planar, that would be this one, that's the molecule 52. So 39 and 52, seems pretty good. And if I look at the RMSD here, I got a bunch of molecules that are moving quite a lot, but I got some molecules that are quite, have quite narrow distribution. And here I find again, my molecule 39 and my molecule 52. This is a quick way to identify your outliers. 
and I can then look at the shape space. And if I look at my um, my PFT, my PFT molecule here, all of them. So now I have 61 molecule here and you can see how much they are clustered, how much they are spread, I should say. And I just wanna highlight now that this molecule 39. So now you see just the highlights. See if I zoom in so you can see, uh, oops, sorry. I'm gonna try to damn, zoom in here. All right, and if I see you, so you see now molecule 39 is very, very confined. So it's not moving much during the simulation as I presume the 52 here, it's much more compact that if you would look at, for instance, this molecule, all those molecules. All right, uh, finally, the spatial distribution function. So now I can define, I'm gonna turn that off and turn that off so we can focus just on the spatial distribution function. So I can define my amyloid, that is actually the collection of my 253 chains and my PFT as being all my PFT molecule. And now I can use this spatial distribution function, function to uh, calculate where are the PFT with respect to the amyloid. And this function SDF is gonna look at the amyloid and recognize that this is repeating units so I can super superimpose them onto each other. And then I will have the distribution of where are the molecules with respect to this uh, reference frame. So opening the density, plotting the density here, it appears like here, like that. And I can clip the plane. So I'm gonna do that immediately around those value here. So now I'm just focusing around one chain. It's a bit too much, sorry. There we go. And, and here I can change the representation maybe to, to cartoon. And I can also show the super superimposed structure, right? Because as I mentioned, I get 253 chains in my system. So I can show them all and here they are. And I can use different coloring for instance. And oh, I can play trajectory. And, and here, what you see is where, where are, what is the high density of PFT molecule, but projected onto one single chain, basically. Uh, you can also export, uh, if you want, this uh, property as a cube file uh, in the export. So this time, not distribution, but you can choose density volume and, and cube, export your, your, your cube file. Uh, all right. I don't know how we're doing with time here, Alessandra. I think we are more or less done, right? Yeah. Uh, I So I will just go to the conclusion here and talk about the, the future of VMD. So we would like in the future to support analysis of multiple systems. So it could either be uh, replicas of the same system, but also we are thinking about uh, comparing uh, system with slight variation, mutation, and so on. Uh, we would like to transition to the next generation graphics IPA. We are working with uh, OpenGL and that causes some issue with Mac. And for that, we will have to move to Metal and Vulkan. We would like to, of course, support more script operations and support more more, more file formats, in particular, Gromax TPR. So like that, we would be able to connect uh, the uh, energies uh, to the topology and improve the feedback also on the energy. Uh, also Amber and, and, and NAMD. And we did not mention that, but now you can, if you are working with LAMPS, you can also uh, open your trajectory with, with VMD. The resource is available on GitHub. Uh, so you can find, of course, uh, the latest release and uh, there is a wiki and tutorial for that. Uh, post issues if you want. And for any other related questions, uh, ideas, uh, we really invite you to use the discussion uh, option of, of uh, GitHub. The paper has been published uh, in December uh, in uh, the Journal of Chemical Information and, and, and Methodology and Modeling, sorry. Uh, and uh, if you use VMD and uh, well, of course, we would appreciate if you could cite it, but also very importantly, we encourage the user to publish their VMD script uh, in supporting information obviously together with their trajectory on Zenodo. So for reproduci reproducibility purposes. And uh, we have uh, on my YouTube channel, there is some tutorial video and uh, VMD is also uh, available on, on uh, Twitter. 
Finally, we would like to acknowledge uh, people that helped us along the way uh, in our shopping, Martin, uh, Ingrid and Anders, the, well, the supervisor of Robin, and Tala who has been helping us on many, many different projects. Gustav, who implemented uh, uh, LAMPS, uh, uh, Parser in PMT, and uh, Caroline and Patrick for the initial project and uh, for where we are today also. And of course, people sharing their data with us on Zenodo and other platform. Uh, VMD has been supported by CERC uh, and, uh, for a long time, and it's still supported by CERC, the Swedish eScience Research Center. And lately, we received some, some funding from InfraVis, which is a infrastructure for, uh, financing for visualization project. And with that, I would like to thank you also for your attention. Thank you very much, Robin. And thank you very much, Mathieu. It was a very nice presentation. So now we have a couple of, I mean, more than a couple of questions, but I want just to start with Scan that has a lot of questions. Can I, I try to unmute you so you could speak? You can speak. Yes, if you have. Please go ahead. You can ask your question, Can. No, Kana is not able to unmute him. Okay, I think he doesn't have the he or she doesn't have the microphone. So I will ask I will read the question in place. Will GPU acceleration implementing movie and video rendering become available? Would you also consider making this a uh, binder plug in as well? It is mostly in C++ after all. Robin, you want to take this one? Uh, so it, it's like a two-part question, either to capture video and the, the video stream as an output, I assume. Well, we, we had many discussions internally about this back and forth, and we, we kind of concluded that we don't really, we want to keep the, the software pretty light and nimble. We don't want to include any major dependencies. And if you wanted to do that properly, that would introduce some major dependencies, which would have kind of bloat the system. Uh, and I think there's good support in the video drivers nowadays for doing video capturing if you just wanted to capture the application. And there's other third party software which does the video capturing as well. So we, we kind of push that on for the future, so to say. Uh, could you remind me of the other part of the question, Alessandra? Blender. Uh, yeah. Would you Blender, uh, consider uh, making this a Blender plugin as well? No, I think there are uh, excellent uh, Blender tool. What's it called, Mathieu? Uh, molecular uh, Notes. Molecular Notes by uh, Brady Johnston. Uh, yeah. So he's doing a, a fantastic job with that already. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to put effort and time in putting any analysis portion of, of this in Blender. I think Blender is an excellent software for doing 3D rendering, and there's good plugins for that already, I would say. OK, thank you. So we have a following question uh, that is by Barbara. So I allowed her to, to speak. Please, you can speak if you want. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. So we were wondering if it is possible to define all non-standard properties and uh, how to achieve that. Um, Robin, you want you want to take it or? Oh, yeah, you could. I, I'm not sure if I followed the question, but uh, well, you, you I, I think that you're you're saying like let's say uh, how can I how can I define my new my new my new function like that, that would do whatever I want, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, well, there is different ways. I mean, the first way is to ask us nicely to implement it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the the second way is to do it yourself by by downloading the source code and and just uh, hard coding it. Uh, but that would be the two options. Uh, I don't know if there would be a, a third one. Uh, Robin. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't exposed any way of you to define your own functions or procedures within the language uh, that is in the script then, right? So you have to, everything is implemented now in C and C++ in the back, and that's what we call into. And you're free if you wanted to implement a function like that and expose it, that you could do that. But as I mentioned in, in, the, in my slides, uh, 
every every procedure can be evaluated in different contexts, so to say, or in, in different modes, right? So you kind of need to have that in the back, back of your head. But I, I'm working on the refining the API in the back so that it would actually be easier for other people to contribute and, and produce functions for the software as well. But we, we haven't really gotten there yet. OK, thank you. Thanks. So then we have the following uh, question that is coming from Edward. I will try to unmute him. Mm. Okay, you can, uh, Edward, you can speak if you want. I guess he doesn't have the microphone. So his question is, is there an option for using a custom shape space? Example, projection into IM vector of Cartesian coordinate, Cartesian space, sorry. Uh, currently, it's a fixed output. We we just compute the shape space based on the eigenvalues of whatever uh, object that you have defined in your selection. Uh, so no, there's there's no custom projection with regard to that. But we do expose the parameters in the script editor. So you could, if you wanted to, uh, export those and do your own uh, rendering outside if you want to do that. Then we have uh, uh, other question. Uh, Khan has also several questions. Is uh, does the trajectory update higher structure? Oh, sorry. Does the trajectory update higher order structure representation in real time, or must an additional analysis be made? Uh, are you are, are we talking about uh, like uh, secondary structure of the protein, for instance, here? I guess so, but I don't know. Okay. Yes. So this is this is pre-calculated when you load your trajectory. For instance, here on the amyloid fibril, uh, when you load it, there is a backbone calculation that is established, and then uh, this is exactly what's what's used to feed the Ramachandran here. So okay. for, the, for the backbone, it's pre-calculated. Yes. We we want to do some more work on the Ramachandran too, so it has the same feel as as other window yet. So we are not completely satisfied with it because we would like to be able to use. Uh, sub subsets of uh, of the full protein to be able to plot the distribution of subsets. Um, so we, we are going to work on that. But yes, the secondary structure of the protein is automatically calculated upon loading. And I also want to chip in there. It's like we use a kind of simplistic model for now for determining the secondary structures of systems because we, we wanted to we wanted to keep the performance right and kind of sacrifice a precision with regard to that. So it's not a, it's not ideal in every scenario. It's going to wrongfully predict uh, beta sheets, for example, sometimes. Yes, thank you. Then, then we have a, a Surya as a question. I am not here. Could you speak, please? No, it doesn't have that. So yes, multiple. So she has a multiple question, and uh, and one is about uh, GPU compliant. Then how much memory it require via via MD, and okay. uh, and uh, do you plan to incorporate incorporate the SSP secondary structure analysis? So uh, VMD, is it G GPU compliant? I mean, it can work without GPU, uh, but if you have a large data set with a large of atom, it's going to become uh, a bit problematic. Uh, in terms of memory, um, well, it, it depends again, uh, but usually we, I think the recommendation was four giga uh, of RAM, right, Robin? Yeah, we, we just, we, in the back, we have something which is called a trajectory or frame cache where we cache all of or some of the some portion of the frames for the trajectory in order to speed up the computations and view of, of the trajectory. But you kind of set that budget in memory when you compile the application and then you can set it for yourself if you wanted to reduce the foot memory footprint, for example. So we don't we don't load everything into memory. So it's not limited by that. We stream on demand the frames if you need if they're not in memory already. And for okay. the SSP, uh, yeah, maybe yes. that, that kind of ties into you know better secondary structure determination, and that's that's but, something that we're looking but into. Basically, all the calculations are made for the DSSP. This is just a way to expose it. So um, that's something that we we would like to do in the future. Yes. 
Okay, so we have a lot of questions, but I will ju I just go in order, and all the questions that are missing, I will put in the in the forum, so you can address there, Matteo, and uh, please, Matteo, and uh, and Robin, if you then you can answer to the questions that are missing. On, we will uh, absolutely, uh, we will absolutely address all of them, and I, I can just see one, and I forgot to take to talk about that. You can export indeed a screenshot by clicking on screenshot and take screenshot. Yeah. <laughs> so, but now I go to, there is a question of Attilio. Now I am mute Attilio if you want to speak. Attilio. Hi. Hi. Yes, please go ahead with your question. Hi, very interesting. So, uh, sorry, I missed the first uh, five minutes. So, <laughs> just to be sure, because uh, I would be really interested in using uh, your software for some kind of analysis. You, you say that uh, uh, now it supports uh, Amber trajectory files already, no. or is something uh, you have to, to... Not yet, not yet Amber. And, and Amber is also... Uh... Uh, coming with uh, with a lot of dependencies and uh, and that's also why we we haven't done it yet. Uh, so not not yet on for the moment, but it supports multiple PDB file. So okay, but even if I I mean uh, anyway, if one uh, let's say transform the trajectory into oh, yeah. TR or XTC, it will work yeah, yeah. anyway. Absol absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You're free to use any uh, any tool you want to convert uh, in any format, and, and you and then that would work uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So then I jump a little around to have a little different question. So Mohamed, as Asad has a question, I try to unmute you if you can ask your question yourself. Please go ahead. I think he doesn't have a microphone. So he thanks a lot for the nice talk. I would love to use VMD in future for trajectory analysis. I have a question. Is there any tools of VMD to do the free energy landscape of MD trajectories? No, not yet. Uh, but that's something that we uh, we we have in mind actually with my colleague uh, Juan, and uh, that's uh, we we might uh, we might work on that in the future. This is something that is in the back of mm -hmm. our heads, and yeah, so we would like to do that. Please give me the possibility to. Hi, who is speaking? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so then I have a final, uh, I will speak up the final question. Uh, maybe Oriol has several. Uh, there is a question. On, there are several questions on QMMM. I will, mm. uh, uh, so then for example, uh, there is one of Khan that I just read it. Is the dynamic bond representation yet available for QM or QMMM MD simulation? Or if not, will be will be will they be? Sorry. Uh, there, there is no uh, there is no dynamic bond uh, for the moment. The bonding is is attributed at the uh, at the initial frame and kept all the way. Uh, yes, that's something that we would like to do in the future. And to continue also in the QMMM, uh, because I see some some discussion about if VMD can read molecular orbital and uh, being an MD software, not for the moment, but we hope to go towards visualization of electronic structure property also in the future. Okay. So there is also connected the question if it can be used for Gromax CPIC2K interface output. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with it, so, so the answer is no. Uh, no. Okay, so then there is, uh, I can, uh, uh, the last question I will ask uh, Oriol if he can, he want to ask, to ask, to ask his question. I am, I allowed him to talk. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, the, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, well, one of the questions was already answered, but uh, the other two, one of them, if is it possible to export the computed information for further analysis and plotting? And the other one is um, if the more advanced functionalities, like for instance the three, this triangular uh, conformation analysis, is described somewhere, or maybe yeah, we yeah, need absolutely, to it out. absolutely. So uh, for exports, uh, you can still see my screen here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for export, you can go here in the script and you can export them 
So you get here, you can export the temporal or the distribution and so on. And you can choose here which one you want to export in the format, XVG or CSV. And when you when you want to export the density, it's going to be in the cube file. Cube file. Um, the same way you can also export your shape space here. So you're going to be able to export them also those, those values or so the, the percentage of the of the three components uh, for each of the molecule that you have I've chosen. And then what was the last question uh, about? Sorry, the last if, part of if your the if the monadband functionality is like for instance this three dimensional uh, mm -hmm. shape space is described or maybe we need yes, to go into sorry, the source yes. code. Absolutely. Uh, so in. Um, in, on the GitHub of uh, VIMD, uh, if you look here in the citations here, there is the citations for the specific tool. And so the the shape space and spatial distribution function uh, is actually uh, published in uh, this. So it's, it's published on the side. Um, if you look at the VIMD paper that we just published in December uh, here, there is also uh, a link where we describe more in detail about the shape space and the link to this paper that is specific to the shape space and, and, and the spatial distribution function. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay. I thank you everybody now. So it's a one hour that we are online. So it's time to have a break. And I thank you all the attendees for the question and in particular Mathieu and Robin for your availability to answer to the question for the very nice presentation. And I close this section here. And I would just before closing, I want to, to announce the following webinar that will come. So if you can give me the opportunity to share my screen, thank you. Okay, uh, so the next uh, Bioxal webinar are the following. We will be the 5th of March. We will have Magnus Lundborg that will speak about Gromax 23 and 24, new feature and improvements. And after that, we will have uh, in after 15th the 19th of March, we will have uh, Giacomo Fiorin and collaborator probably speaking about Colvars. So Colvars, a collaborative variables model for molecular dynamic simulation program. Okay, so you are all most welcome. I thank you for today. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Or day for who was in the day. <laughs>